morning or good afternoon and welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Shana Carney and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. The NCCWSC Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change and impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predictive climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. To start things off, please join me in welcoming Sean Carter from the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, who will be introducing today's speaker. Sean? Thank you, and uh, it's my pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Keith Nislow with us. He's a team leader and a research fisheries biologist for the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station. He's also adjunct associate professor at the Department of Environmental Conservation at UMass Amherst. And finally, Keith is also acting as a co-principal investigator at the Northeast Climate Science Center, uh, which is affiliated with our center here. Keith has uh, uh, degrees from New Mexico, University of New Mexico, and also Dartmouth, and he's been with the Forest Service Research and Development for the last 16 years. And today, Keith brings us uh, his expertise in research dealing with the relationship of ecosystem change and aquatic habitat and the distribution and abundance of fish and aquatic invertebrates. And he's particularly interested in, in uh, using basic science to assist restoration, conservation, and management. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce someone I'm very fond of, Keith Nislow, uh, for today's webinar. So take it away, Keith. Thanks very much, Sean, and, and thanks everyone at, at uh, NICWISC. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to talk to you guys uh, today and everyone on the line about uh, some of the work we've been doing and some of the issues that we're interested in. So uh, my, my very first thought in, in starting to put this talk together after having given um, Holly the title, it seems like many, many eons ago, was, wow, what a stupid title. And uh, I think, you know, we've all been in this kind of situation where we, we send in a title for a talk, you know, it, it sounds amusing at the time, and then we just sort of grimace. And I was faced with a choice. Do I try and change it at the last minute, or do I double down and try and make some sense of it? And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a fool, I, I, I kept the title, and I'll, I'll try and make some sense of it uh, uh, to everyone in the line. So we're interested in extreme climate events. Obviously, uh, they have an influence and, and draw attention way out of proportion to their actual frequency. And uh, in a sense, they've really, uh, uh, some of the extreme events, particularly that have hit the Northeast U.S. in the last uh, three to four years, uh, have become the, the poster child for potential climate change in the region. So going back to my bad title, um, this actually was a bit of a, a controversy back in the early days of ecological science. And uh, you really, we, we had a, a, a kind of an interesting debate uh, between two uh, uh, general camps. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, you know, uh, folks led by uh, Andrew Ortha and Birch uh, who really stressed an overriding influence of climate, particularly climate extremes, uh, and uh, in, in driving population dynamics and, the, and the, the distribution and abundance of animals. In contrast, the, in the no big deal school, although this is a really a, an overstatement, we had uh, folks like G. Evelyn Hutchinson, Bob MacArthur, uh, a group that was really focused on equilibrium dynamics carrying capacity and population regulation via density-dependent processes. And so, again, it's a stretch to say that uh, for these folks, these climate extremes and these climate events are no big deal, but much more focused on how populations got back to an equilibrium or carrying capacity and less of a focus on those extremes in driving dynamics. And obviously, um, as we're, we've been moving forward in the last uh, 50 years of ecological science, we certainly realize that we need to bring these two perspectives together in order to understand uh, the effect of uh, these extreme climate events on population dynamics, a topic that has become 
even more important, given the non-stationarity of frequency, timing, and duration of climate extremes that we expect uh, in, a, in, a, in a changing uh, regional climate. And this is just some data uh, from uh, uh, the, the Northeast Climate Science Center from Ray, uh, Ray, Ray Bradley's lab and his uh, postdoc. Uh, and it's gonna, it deals with an aspect of climate that I'll be focused on a lot today, uh, the, uh, particularly the, uh, dura the frequency of extreme precipitation events. I'm an aquatic ecologist, I'm really interested in floods. And as I mentioned, these large floods really have been a hallmark of climate extremes in this region over the last four to five years since the Climate Science Center uh, has been in existence. And uh, obviously there's lots of variability, lots of uncertainty in these predictions, but it, it does seem like uh, it, it's going to be a, a blue world uh, with respect to uh, intense precipitation, the possibility for extreme, extreme climate. So these, this brings up some really important uh, science questions from the perspective of fish and wildlife population dynamics. First, are there critical thresholds in frequency, duration, timing, and magnitude that increase risk to populations? And then uh, from a more of an operational standpoint, but also from a basic understanding of, of standpoint, what is the relative importance of changes in extremes versus changes in central tendencies? Uh, with respect to climate. And uh, this has particular importance because of the difficulty in generating robust forecasts of climate extreme regimes. And so from the, the wildlife and fish perspective, from the natural resource perspective, we need to have a really good sense of what the importance of these events are if we're going to task modelers with coming up with better and better forecasts. With respect to management implications, uh, some obvious uh, 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 questions of interest are how do these changes in extreme events influence predictions of distribution abundance? And maybe even more importantly, does considering extreme events change the prioritization and the relative value of specific management actions? Obviously here uh, in the Climate Science Center at NICWIS, we're interested in actionable science, and this is our major concern. Are we going to ask managers to do things differently if we consider changes in these extreme events? So the rest of the talk, I just want to give you a, a, a bit of a, a roadmap. I'm going to be talking about uh, population demography, conservation genetics, habitat, and then I'm going to end with human responses. I am going to talk a lot about fish, which is uh, just that's, that's the way I am, and it, it's hard for me to get away from, but I hope to achieve some level of generality using uh, fish uh, and a few other, uh, other taxa as uh, case studies. And so before I get too far uh, in my uh, talk, I want to acknowledge that the work I'm going to be talking about is a very, very much a collective effort involving uh, a lot of, of, of great cooperators uh, from the USGS, particularly uh, Ben Letcher, my longtime cooperator at uh, the Conti Anadromous Fish Research Center, who pioneered a lot of this work on brook trout. Uh, uh, Jason Coombs, uh, my postdoctoral researcher, who's done a lot of the modeling and, and uh, uh, additional work. And Andrew Whiteley, who runs the Aquatic Conservation Genetics Laboratory here at UMass, which is co-supported uh, by the Forest Service. And, and UMass, and then of course uh, acknowledge all of the institutions that have funded or supported this research, including the Northeast Climate Center, uh, USGS, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, UMass, Forest Service, and many others. And not only am I going to be talking a lot about fish, I'm going to be talking a lot about a particular kind of fish, brook trout, in a particular place. This is our long-term study site uh, in West Brook. Uh, in uh, western Massachusetts. Uh, we've been at it for uh, uh, a long time now, uh, pushing uh, 20 years, uh, and uh, we got this site very well uh, uh, monitored. So lots of years of long-term, uh, very intensive individual-based data, which in over the past 10 years, we've branched out to include conservation genetics perspectives. 
uh, uh, as well. And so you'll hear a lot about this site uh, at various points in the talk. So I'm going to start the talk talking about uh, uh, demography um, and uh, particularly talking about uh, temporal variation. And so one of the things that's really interesting about a lot of the species that we deal with is that uh, we do see a lot of climate-associated variability in population numbers, uh, but we see these populations persist. So before we get into the potential effects of climate extremes and changes in climate extreme regimes, we're going to take a little time and talk about how populations and species that we're interested in deal with the kind of climate variability that they're experiencing now and have ex experienced over most of their uh, evolutionary history. And really important concept here to start out with is the, the, concept, con the concept of stock and recruitment, which relates the numbers of stock, number of spawners, number of adults, uh, uh, however you want to describe it for whatever species you're interested in, uh, yielding a certain number of recruits, the number of young that survive the recruitment phase to become potential spawners. And I'm going to focus uh, uh, a little bit here on recruitment because it's a really important uh, life stage for many, many species, and it has an important intersection with climate and particularly climate extremes. Uh, we're really interested in recruitment, uh, and it's often very important because for many species, it's the most vulnerable life history stage. You're dealing with small, inexperienced, competitively in inferior individuals, whether you're talking about uh, tree seedlings or fledgling birds, have here in the middle of the screen, or, or uh, fish larvae that are, are just getting rid of the yolk sac. And they're, oftentimes they're in the process of transitioning from dependence on maternal resources uh, to independence. As a consequence of this vulnerability, uh, we often see very high mortality during this stage, so very high uh, variation in, uh, in, in survival, leading to very high annual variability in recruitment that is in turn tied to interannual variation in climate. So just this is an example of uh, what uh, uh, a, a, a larval brook trout in West Brook might be experiencing as they uh, begin to uh, absorb their yolk sacs and emerge from the gravel. So what we he have here uh, in uh, the stippled line, the stipple line shows the uh, uh, decrease uh, from high flows in the spring, April, uh, down to base flows uh, in, in, in the later spring, consequent increase in temperature. And this is the period when uh, young larval brook trout, brook trout fry, uh, recruit from the fry stage uh, to the young juvenile stage. And one of the things that's, that we see time and time again in many stream cell monitor populations like brook trout is that high recruitment years are linked to successful match between environmental conditions at recruitment and the stage the fish are in when they're ready to recruit. Conversely, when there's a mismatch between these annual, these, these fry requirements, for example, if they emerge early when flows are too high, water is too cold, they can have very, very low survival and can even completely fail to recruit. So you can have years, depending on particular flow conditions and particularly associated with extreme flows that can wipe out an entire recruit class. Conversely, there are some species, like these floodplain trees, that depend on extreme events during critical recruitment phases to successfully recruit. So these silver maples here lining the Connecticut River, uh, they may go through many years of no recruitment, of no successful recruitment until they get just the right flood at just the right time to allow their seedlings and saplings to recruit to the population. So just to, to follow on this a bit, uh, so we see this high uh, annual variability, and it's variable to the extent that for many populations, we have many years 
where recruitment is zero or close to zero. And as a, a further on consequence, a lot of these populations may indeed be recruitment limited. So the number of individuals that get through that stage is going to determine uh, how big a cohort you're going to have, how abundant that population is throughout the, the course of its, of its existence, uh, of that cohort's existence. And so just to, to demonstrate that a bit, uh, so this is uh, some work that I did with a uh, uh, colleague, Joan Armstrong, in Scotland. And uh, we were uh, looking at when we would expect to see recruitment limitation. And so this is just a, a, a diagram that, that uh, illustrates that. The left-hand side of the, the, uh, the, the graph, uh, you've got uh, two levels of uh, uh, salmon fry recruitment. And what the, the, the graph describes is the change in numbers on the y-axis, so uh, the log change in, in numbers of individuals, uh, and the change in the size of those individuals. So as in uh, almost all populations, this isn't just true uh, for uh, stream-growing salmonids, it's particularly true for forest trees. As individuals increase in size, they are reduced in number. And so that uh, reduction, as you see uh, leading from uh, the recruitment part of the graph, in the uh, lightly stippled lines, uh, that's just density-independent mortality. So there's just some level of mortality going on. And what we can see is that as long as that mortality or that survival doesn't exceed the carrying capacity of the habitat for older juveniles in the post-recruitment phase, that the number of individuals coming out of this juvenile phase, which is the size of the arrows, uh, at the, on the right-hand side of the graph uh, is directly proportional to the levels of recruitment. So this is an example of where uh, 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 a recruitment is an overriding influence on cohort size or number, number of individuals. So we see a lot of recruitment variation of persistence. As I mentioned, uh, to the extent that in many populations you can have a number of years of zero recruitment, zero survival during this stage, and yet these populations can persist. And so I'm going to talk about a couple, uh, both the ability of these populations to persist, to buffer uh, many years of uh, low recruitment, and some of the mechanisms that are involved in that buffering, in that compensation uh, for, for low recruitment and low abundance. And then I'm going to talk about how that relates to changes in uh, extreme event regimes. So one uh, important mechanism that helps populations recover from low density at any stage is density dependence. Uh, and classic density dependence, where we have increased survival and growth of recruits at low density, as well as in some cases increased survival, growth, and fecundity of adults. And both of those processes help populations recover from uh, low density. You can see here, this is the graph uh, from a paper uh, by my colleague, uh, uh, Sigurd Einem and I, uh, and we looked at how initial density of salmon fry influenced the total number of, uh, of, of recruits, of juvenile recruits that we had at the end of the stage. And we can see two things here. So uh, the, uh, the dark bars are on a in a low flow year. Uh, I'm sorry, the dark circles are, uh, we did this experiment in uh, a low flow year, so relatively benign year, no floods. The white circles are when we did this experiment in a year with uh, a pretty major flood during the recruitment phase. And so we see here the process, the, the, the outcome of both differences in flow regimes and flood regimes, but also a really strong density dependence so that in the uh, benign year, uh, we, that, that the performance, the survival of fish at low densities was great enough to result in essentially the same output of fry uh, as 
of when we had lots of fry escaping that recruitment. So increased uh, uh, performance, increased survival, growth, and fecundity at low density is a very powerful mechanism allowing uh, these populations to uh, respond uh, to uh, low recruitment and low abundance. The other important mechanism, or another important mechanism, is a component of uh, what we call the ecological storage effect. And uh, what this component is essentially that in populations that have long-lived, highly fecund adults, uh, like forest trees, uh, like uh, 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 large adult salmon, uh, the storage or the ability of those adults to persist across multiple bad years of poor recruitment is a critical component to persistence. And this is really manifest, or it's, 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 it's possible, because as bad as recruitment can be, it can't be less than zero. So you, if you can't have recruitment less than zero, it means, again, particularly for these highly fecund species, which in a good year, when everything goes right when all the holes in the Swiss cheese uh, line up, can have just absolute booms of recruitment, and the good years can be much better than the bad years. What I have illustrating here is this is um, uh, the relationship between egg number and uh, uh, between length of, of individual brook trout and, and the number of eggs uh, in that, that females have. And what we can see is a very strong size dependence. So that if you get to be two, three years old, reach 200 millimeters, your potential reproductive output, your fecundity, can be an order of magnitude uh, greater than fish that mature at 105, 125 millimeters. So to pull this together a bit, one of the ways that species can persist in the face of uh, lots of, 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 very, of highly variable climates and uh, influential uh, uh, extreme climate events is to combine these aspects of, of compensatory skill. And so what I've, I've tried to do here is to display this uh, in, in three dimensions. And just to review, uh, the, the factors that are involved in this recruitment variation of persistence, long-lived adults, adults that live multiple years and are often more resilient in the face of climate regimes than these vulnerable juveniles and vulnerable recruits that I talked about. Not only are, can adults be uh, long-lived, but if they're, uh, uh, if they continue to grow throughout their lives, so that their size is somewhat dependent on age and their growth is indeterminate. Unlike us, you know, fish, trees continue to grow. And as a consequence of that growth, they can be very fecund, have very high potential reproductive output, output so high in size dependent fecundity. And then finally, as I mentioned a couple of slides earlier, uh, strong density dependence, big increases in performance at low density. And so to illustrate those factors, I just uh, draw a contrast and get away from fish for a little bit. Uh, so let's consider sort of your typical uh, neotropical songbird, uh, this is the Blackburnian warbler, I think. Uh, and, you know, like most songbirds, it's not particularly long-lived. Uh, it's fecundity or it's variation fecundity particularly compared to some of the other species we'll talk about, is tiny. Very small variation in fecundity. Uh, uh, so not a lot of scope for highly fecund adults to compensate for uh, bad years. And then finally, uh, not a lot of consistent evidence for strong density dependence in a lot of these songbird species. So all of these factors combined to put species like uh, like Bernie warblers and other songbirds at the very corner of this three-dimensional 
uh, space uh, that, that describes the potential for compensatory response. In contrast, species like many fishes, as I mentioned, you can have orders of magnitude variation in fecundity as a function of adult size. And similarly, forest trees, where you also have that same a very high variation of fecundity, uh, very, you could have, uh, particularly for forest trees, they're long-lived, so they continue to grow, continue to get big. And for both the salmonid fishes that I study and uh, forest trees that folks like Tony and many others study, uh, very strong density dependence, so very good performance at low density. So all of these factors giving species that are in this piece of life history space a lot of compensatory scope uh, to buffer uh, the effects of, of extreme events. So given this, this very high variation in recruitment, vari in, in, in recruitment with simultaneous persistence, what are some of the management implications for dealing with changes in extreme event regimes associated with this kind of, of temporal variation of populations? So one important one, or one thing that's, that's really worth looking at is, can we define recruitment failure thresholds? So we talked about populations' abilities to buffer uh, individual bad years, individual recruitment failure events, but how many climate-related bad years are too many? And can we directly relate those frequencies and magnitudes to climate predictions? So let's talk a little bit about some work uh, that uh, uh, Yoichiro Kano uh, did uh, uh, well, he was a postdoc in, in, in Bed's lab working with us on brook trout. And uh, he uh, used a Dale Madsen model to look at uh, brook trout abundance uh, from a, a really good uh, long-term uh, uh, population monitoring program uh, uh, from the Shenandoah National Park, so a great data set, I think about 25 years of data. And uh, he uh, parameterized a model environmental model uh, uh, based on those data, and then in the model, he changed the uh, frequency of different kinds of uh, extreme climate events in different seasons, low flows, high flows, winter, summer, fall, and because he had that kind of data, he was able to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, do some scenarios and look at how these populations would respond, particularly with respect to their persistence under different regimes. And what he found uh, was that under reasonable levels of extreme event frequency, as we see now, we saw a strong ability of these populations to persist. So low flows every five years, high winter flows every five years, we really didn't see a change in, uh, 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 the, the, you know, in, in equilibrium adult abundance. As we got into more extreme situations, higher magnitudes, higher frequencies, uh, and different combinations, Yoichiro did start to uh, see some thresholds that beyond which these populations would decline to very low and, uh, and, and, and very vulnerable uh, numbers. So if we've got good population models, we can try and look at the scope for persistence under different types of extreme climate event regimes. And that can help to improve our forecast, get a better sense of this, that original uh, science question I posed, what is likely to be more important, changes in extreme events or changes in, in mean, mean tendencies? 
another interesting, in my perspective, imagine implication, implication for, under, for, for how these populations persist under recruitment uncertainty is that we tend to focus a lot on resilient habitats uh, with respect to population persistence. But our understanding of population dynamics suggests that if we manage to maximize compensatory scope and storage for those species where it's really important, we might do a lot of good, as much good as, as focusing on habitats. And one way to do this is to focus on individuals and or life history strategies with high reproductive value. For example, this, this giant lake trout uh, that might have a potential fecundity of, uh, you know, 20,000, 30,000 eggs. Uh, and we're justified in this focus in, in, in from a, a wide range of research. Some of our own research in our study system in Westbrook has really pointed out the value of these large, potentially high reproductive value individuals in the population. So what we have here uh, in the top graph, the only graph, is we've got size state uh, on the x-axis and uh, the elast summed elasticity, which is how influential variation in survival of fish at any of those size classes is to overall population performance in this case, measured as lambda, the population growth rate, one if it's a stable population, above one, uh, below uh, one if it's, if it's declining. So what we found was in this model, and this is uh, uh, work that we published in 2007 plus, um, is that the influence of these large, high reproductive value individuals, even though they were a relatively small proportion of the population was well out of was 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 well out of proportion to their abundance, and so it suggested that uh, if we target management strategies for these uh, these large individuals, that we might be lending these populations a lot of resilience in the face of variability. And what's nice is that we've actually got some management implications, some management tools to try and address this. Uh, almost everyone in fisheries has heard of uh, slot limits, and this is in, in contrast to size limits where you fish need to be a certain size before you take them. Um, that where in, in, in contrast to the size limit, in a slot limit, you've got protection both for young fish, for small fish that haven't yet recruited uh, to the uh, spawning populations, which is the classic justification for the size limit in managing a sustainable fishery, uh, but you also have protection for those large high value individuals. So you're not allowed to take uh, small individuals, but you're also not allowed to take the largest individuals. And similarly, in forest ecology, everyone is familiar with diameter limit harvest. So these are two well-established management techniques that are done for all kinds of reasons, but we suggest might also contribute to resilience from extreme events and the population variability associated with it. And if we get our models right and do this work correctly, we can give managers an idea of just how much resilience uh, they're getting uh, from these management techniques. So uh, exploitation isn't the only thing that selects against large body size, selects against these individuals that might be very important in resilience to extreme events. One of the other things we found in our modeling exercise, modeling work at West Brook, is that uh, we've got uh, three sites, uh, the three upper, uh, the, the red, green, and blue uh, lines here that are part of a connected 
system, so two tributaries and a main stem, uh, where individuals can move freely between, between those habitats. In uh, the, the, the purple line describes uh, the situation in one of our tributaries, which is isolated by a waterfall from the rest of the system. And what we found uh, really clearly was that we looked at the probability of survival, survival probabilities for these large, potentially high value fish were substantially lower in the isolated tri tributaries, providing evidence that, that there's selection potentially against large fish in isolated habitat. So this selection against large high value fish in uh, isolated small stream habitat combined with access to high growth downstream lakes and ocean habitats allowing fish to move to gain these growth opportunities, which is, again, probably the, the fundamental reason why fish adopt migratory strategies in the first place. Allowing fish to do that, allowing in, in not just fish, but individuals from any species to maximize growth opportunity if and when size is related to fecundity and reproductive value can help to contribute to resilient populations. So I'm going to move from our temporal variation recruitment associated with uh, uh, environmental variability uh, to spatial variation. And an interesting thing to note is that we've talked about, or I've talked about, some uh, temporal mechanisms that can restore or regulate the numbers of individuals, that can, that can help to regulate population size and keep up with it low. One interesting thing is even though these mechanisms can uh, help population numbers recover from low, from low values, they can't restore alleles. They can't restore genetic diversity. So as if populations go through bottlenecks, even if they are, are able to respond demographically in the ways that we've talked about, they're still going to lose genetic diversity with some potentially important consequences. And this is a really interesting contrast with spatial compensatory mechanisms, where you've got the potential both to restore numbers, mechanisms I'll talk about, and to uh, restore uh, uh, genetic, restore and conserve genetic diversity. And this is, has some imp implications for populations in the face of extreme events. So the basic idea here is that instead of good years compensating for bad years, good locations, the locations where numbers of recruitment are good, are compensating for bad locations. Uh, this is closely tied uh, to the metapopulation concept, where we have uh, subpopulations uh, uh, potentially subsidizing each other and maintaining uh, the overall population level. And also, more recently, to what uh, Dan Schindler described as portfolio effects, where if you've got variation, environmentally associated variation in recruitment, you're encompassing a diversity of conditions that may respond differently to extreme events, you can enable persistence. And, and so that's why this, uh, if you've got this diversity across the landscape and subpopulations are connected, uh, can be a really important mechanism for uh, 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 keeping populations resilient. And so uh, I said I was going to talk a lot about uh, West Brook and Brook Trout. Now I'm going to talk a lot about uh, Hurricane Irene, uh, which uh, was in a, a, a major flood event that occurred in 2011. Uh, record flooding in uh, western New England um, and uh, flood of record in, in, most of, in, in, in many, many rivers, uh, uh, lots of damage, uh, lots of impact. Uh, and along with this, of course, we saw some immediate reductions in, in trout numbers. And oftentimes, uh, trout populations are quite resilient, particularly the adults, 
to pretty high flows. They're good at finding refuges. They're good at persisting under what seems like pretty intense conditions. In this case, uh, we saw uh, 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 some, some substantial losses, uh, particularly of our radio tagged fish, where we had really good records. They were adults. They were successful. And so uh, it, was, it was really a, a, a big flood. And you can see from the picture, the, the, the top picture there, uh, you've got lots of bed movement, lots of scour, lots of action, lots of power, and that's the kind of thing that really gets trout. And so we were interested, and we actually had the ability to try and look at how this reduction, this extreme event, put populations in jeopardy of reductions in genetic diversity with potential longer-term consequences. So again, even though they could potentially recover demographically, what were the consequences genetically? We were in luck because we had, uh, uh, we happened to have genetic samples from a number of rivers that were uh, 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 subsequently impacted by Irene before Irene and then after Irene. So this is, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, this is the Millbrook watershed, which is in western Massachusetts. And on the right, uh, we've got uh, uh, the, a number of alleles, measure of allelic diversity in two sites, uh, which, again, I wish I could find a pointer, but I can't. Hopefully this will work. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Millbrook, above and below a potential, above and below a, a barrier to migration. And uh, while we saw reductions in uh, allelic diversity uh, at a number of those sites, what was interesting, or the interesting result that, that, that seems to be emerging, and these data are still being analyzed, is that we were most concerned about sites, I don't know if anyone can see this, uh, small headwater sites that were above barriers. Because our thought was they would lose allelic diversity as a consequence of this reduction number in the, in, in the flood, but they couldn't then be subsidized from uh, downstream. Uh, and those were our major concerns. But what turned out is that the sections that seemed to lose the most allelic diversity were the further downstream sections, more towards the main stem mill brook, whereas our headwaters actually retained allelic diversity quite well. And this bears directly on this concept of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the portfolio effect because it's, a, it's a potentially a really good illustration of how extreme events, extreme climate event disturbances, if they're manifest differently in different systems, can be buffered against by the population. And what we're thinking we're seeing here is that in, even in very large floods, very, very small headwaters right at the threshold of perenniality may be less vulnerable because they experience, depending on the way the flood is generated, reduced increases in per unit power during flood generation. Once you get to the mid-reaches, once you get downstream, you're going to see increased stream power, bed movement, overbank floods. And that jives very well with what we actually saw on the ground with Irene, that the, the, the streams and rivers that really got hammered uh, were mid-reaches and not headwaters. What's interesting, too, is that other kinds of extreme climate, you could see the exact opposite. For example, uh, droughts might be particularly challenging for headwaters, again, at this threshold for perennial flow which is actually quite a bit of, of brook trout habitat. And so maintaining these connections between different habitats that respond differently to extreme events could be quite important. So in, with respect to management implications, well, I mean, this is like, it's like being against apple pie to be, to, to be against increasing connectivity. Uh, everyone wants to do it. We all know it's important. It's a, it's a major management initiative. But again, by recognizing some of these effects and establishing them, we can value them with respect for their resilience. More interesting, in a sense, is that 
do have some potentially challenges or some potential conflict for species with relatively narrow habitat requirements. For example, cold water fishers like brook trout, if you're prioritizing based on thermal resilience and you're focusing only on the headwaters, uh, then, or you're focusing only on one longitudinal strata in the network, you're not going to get that portfolio effect of differential impacts at differential points in the system helping to, to make populations more resilient. And that's where some of these uh, uh, prioritization schemes, folks like Matt Seibel uh, in the Midwest that specifically consider stream order diversity in terms of prioritizing barrier removals can be particularly important, even for species with relatively uh, 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 narrow requirements, if that stream order diversity also uh, results in extreme events having differential effects uh, in different parts of the connected network. And obviously, incorporating this into model simulations is key. Okay. And then finally, you've got some interesting uh, uh, potentials for directly mitigating the effects of losses of alleles during losses birth day during extreme events. Uh, and uh, we're working with that now with the genetic rescue experiment where we're bringing fish from anthropogenically isolated from, from into anthropogenically isolated populations and trying to restore that diversity and seeing what effect that has on us. So I'll go relatively quickly through the rest of my slides. The slides, in addition to demographic and conservation genetic effects, obviously this important effects of climate regimes on uh, habitats themselves. And the real difference here is that uh, in the demographic effect, we we're talking about climate events moving things up and down with respect to some carrying capacity. With respect to the climate regime's effects on habitats, we're looking at changes in the carrying capacity itself. And just a way to demonstrate this is in contrast to the top graph that I showed earlier, the bottom panel, you've got a lower carrying capacity for older juvenile fish, and that's going to result in a substantially a lower ultimate population size. And that often the result of the changes in habitats. Streams and rivers, uh, extreme events always had some recognition of their importance. Strong influence of the two-year flood and shaping channel plan form, bed cal caliber, floodplain channel connectivity. A lot of things were interested. But what about the more extreme flows associated with things like Hurricane Irene and that may become more frequent uh, and more intense in the future? And some, one, an interesting point here is that could potentially see a shift in some dominant habitat forming mechanisms, particularly mechanisms associated with importing wood, sediment, other materials from terrestrial environments to streams, changing the relative dominance of chronic processes like single tree mortality, bank erosion, to more episodic uh, uh, mechanisms. For example, extreme winds and hill slope failure, like I've shown in, that, uh, in the, the, the picture to the left. Similarly, in forests, uh, direct relationship with the frequency and magnitude of timing of extreme events uh, with respect to the relative importance of climate associated events like fires, floods, wind throw, drought versus classic competition. And, and successional dynamics. In terms of, of management implications, I think that the interesting thing here is uh, to try and bring extreme event predictions and habitat goals and expectations together and also underscores the need to combine empirical and mechanistic models, both of which have strengths and weaknesses with respect to their ability to incorporate extreme events. Empirical models, those events are in there for example, that, that, you know, the, the state, that all the mechanisms that determine a uh, climate envelope uh, for a given species, frequency and magnitude of extreme events is implicit, but mechanistic models can help make them explicit and help us look at thresholds for tolerance and 
And this could be particularly useful when we've got a lot of work. For example, this is work uh, done uh, by uh, Dave King in my lab on uh, disturbance-dependent birds, uh, establishing these relationships, the ability to tie these relationships between time since it's disturbance, in this case, actual uh, manual treatment, but potentially natural disturbance, could make these models much more effective. So I'm going to end uh, quickly uh, with respect to some human responses. And uh, when we're, I'm talking about human responses to extreme events, I'm talking about responses to the events themselves, and also responses to the risk of, 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 of the, either the perceived or actual risk of these events. And with the general point being that in highly settled regions like most of the Northeast, human response has the capacity to really override natural dynamics and do what I'm going to call, and, and you know, I, I realize this is kind of a value-laden uh, uh, way to describe it, very strong uh, uh, influence on whether or not you catalyze virtuous versus vicious cycles of response and impact from the perspective of natural resources. And just briefly what I mean by that, so obviously Hurricane Irene, as you guys know well, and other hurricanes not only affected uh, habitats and, and natural populations, but the big impact on people, uh, particularly human infrastructure. Uh, and so one route, one virtuous cycle that could be that, 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 that could be catalyzed by all these road failures is recognition of their importance, uh, uh, real emphasis on right-sizing road stream crossings uh, with the concomitant benefits of less damage next time. And we've shown pretty clearly that those road crossings that were right-sized, both our group and Natural SB and far service groups, state folks, that those road crossings that were right-sized, uh, that were over the bankful width of the channel, the N on that graph in, in the, the presentation there, uh, uh, were much less likely to fail than the large majority of crossings that were less than bankful uh, size. So you've got less infrastructure damage, and you also have more habitat connectivity and more resilient populations. So what I would call a virtuous cycle. Uh, in contrast, Catastrophic flooding, roads go out, regulations lifted, anything that's at hand gets thrown in uh, uh, the stream uh, to, to rebuild the road, and you've got the possibility for more damage next time, uh, more habitat fragmentation, and more vulnerable populations. And then I uh, want to uh, close uh, with uh, uh, by uh, referencing a recognizing study by Anita Millman here at, at UMass at Department of Environmental Conservation, you know, recognizing how important people's responses and attitudes are in moving things along these different paths is uh, currently uh, uh, working on a, a, a survey of riparian landowners in Vermont who have been affected uh, by Irene and their responses think are worth listening to and worth engaging if we want to more fully manage in the context of these kinds of, of changes in extreme events. So, you know, I think that one of the things that we can really do uh, with respect to uh, looking at the multiple dimensions of resilience to extreme events is, is to put this in the context of uh, vulnerability and exposure. And uh, this is a graph that, that Andrew and Ben and I uh, put together. And what it shows is how, with increasing exposure to any kind of climate impact, which is on the uh, x-axis, uh, the deviation of that horizontal line which is no sensitivity, so essentially you're having no change in the performance parameter, in this case abundance, uh, uh, with increasing exposure uh, to, uh, 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 to, uh, to climate extremes or other aspects of climate. Uh, and then the family of curves below that show increasing levels of sensitivity to a given level of exposure. And we found this a really helpful framework 
within which to put both the different mechanisms of resilience and the different management actions that can be taken to try and address that resilience. John, I'll turn it over to you. Did you have any closing comments or words for us? Hi, this is actually Emily Fort. Sean had to duck out from Nick West, but um, just to say thanks to, this, to Keith and to everyone for attending. Um, as always, we appreciate it.